Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us at our corporate workshop today. Uh, my name is Sean Gorda. I'm a senior staff product manager at Twist, and I primarily oversee our NGS on oncology profile. Uh, quick housekeeping, we will take a Q&A after both mine and Dr. Keats's presentation. Okay. So a quick background on uh, Twist as a company. Uh, we were founded in 2013. Uh, we're headquartered out of South San Francisco. And we have offices in beautiful Carlsbad, San Diego, and Tel Aviv. And we are currently building out our factory of the future in Portland, Oregon. Uh, this is going to help us scale up to meet the growing market need and drastically reduce turnaround time. So the linchpin of Twist's business is our proprietary sequencing technology. Uh, this enables us to produce enormous amounts of high-quality DNA. And we do this on a silicon wafer chip. Um, looks much like a pattern flow cell, uses microfluidics in nanowells to synthesize up to 1 million oligos per chip, uh, which equates to about 9,600 genes per chip. Uh, this is in stark contrast to traditional technology, which uses your typical 96-well uh, plate and can only synthesize one oligo uh, per well. Uh, so the scale and throughput is, is enormous. Uh, we have a host of different products across the library preparation and target enrichment solution space. Um, on the library prep end, we have enzymatic and mechanical fragmentation kits, as well as our methylation detection system, uh, all of which can be used uh, in combination with our UMI and UDI adapter systems to create sequencing libraries. Um, from there, on the target enrichment end, we have fixed and custom panels, um, as well as our alliance panels. So these are capture panels that have been designed um, in concert with key opinion leaders in the field. Um, and we also have methylome and methylation uh, capture panels as well. Um, our customers come back to us time and time again because of our high quality, but primarily for our uniformity, um, which drastically reduces sequencing costs uh, compared to other target enrichment solutions that are, that are on the market. Um, we are continuing to innovate and provide market-leading tools in the oncology space, including minimal residual disease, uh, which I will touch on in a bit later, uh, as well as hereditary cancer analysis. Um, and all of these workflows um, are designed to be used together, but can be mixed and matched and can be dropped into any existing workflow. So our probes are double-stranded. Um, so we like to think of this as having two shots on goal during target enrichment or hybridization. Um, so you can actually hybridize or pull down both the top and bottom strand of your library, uh, library prep fragments. And this greatly um, improves the efficiency of the capture. Um, additionally, we do NGSQC all of our probes, the individual prob probes that we put in the pool and we send to you um, to ensure that they do exist and they are in the probe pool. Um, and workflows and uh, target enrichment is scalable from a handful of probes in a single panel um, up to the exome or, or past it. Uh, but really, the, the main benefit of target enrichment is that it greatly reduces your sequencing cost. You're able to only focus on the, the area of the genome that you're interested in sequencing, um, which allows more samples per run and lower cost. Um, Okay, so one of the highlights of target enrichment is that it allows you the flexibility to interrogate um, whatever your application or the, the area of your research is focusing on. So on the right, or, uh, on the x-axis here is the number of targets. So spanning from essentially zero, you can have one or even two probes in a single pool um, past the exome footprint. And then on the y-axis is the um, depth of coverage. So Say you're interested in germline or genotyping sequencing at 30x coverage over maybe, say, 73 genes. Um, you can do that, and it saves, uh, you can save a lot on sequencing cost. You can use that same footprint to do somatic detection at, at greater depths. Um, or if you're looking at something like MRD, uh, you can just do a handful of targets and sequence at extreme depth um, for rare variant allele detection. Um, so whatever you're looking at or whatever the, the focus of your research, you can use target enrichment to greatly save on cost uh, and maximizing sequencing efficiency. Um, so our oligo pools are optimized for uniform capture. So on the right side of your screen here is what an ideal capture would be. So um, this is where all of your targets are sequenced to the exact same depth. Um, this is what we, when we talk about uniformity, that's what uniformity would look like. 
Um, and what you see on the bottom side on the right uh, is an, an uneven capture, and we really try to avoid this because the over and under sequenced uh, regions that are pointed out here are essentially wasted. Um, the under sequenced region doesn't meet your threshold, so you either have to Sanger it or sequence deeper. Um, and then the over sequencing, while beneficial, can be optimized in other places, ideally to, to round out under sequenced areas. Um, but we're able to uh, preserve this uniform capture through two methods, our uniform synthesis technology. So during the production or the actual manufacturing of our probe pools, we bin the synthesis of each probe by its GC content. Um, and we actually tailor the concentration um, and the copy number within the probe pool based on that GC content, which preserves the oligofrequency across the whole spectrum. Uh, and then afterwards, we amplify using a high fidelity enzyme. Uh, and this preserves that uniformity and reduces probe bias. So on the bottom here, um, you'll see there's a, a probe bias distribution, which can directly result in um, that uneven capture that you see on the bottom right, <clears throat> mainly because um, some, it, it, depending on the GC content, some are a uh, little stronger than others. Uh, in addition to our um, fixed panels, we also have a robust uh, custom panel workflow um, through our, what we call it, the design, build, test, and learn workflow. Uh, so this starts with you meeting one, uh, our team of bioinformatics scientists. Um, I used to be one. <laughs> and we will work with you to develop a custom target enrichment capture panel depending on um, what you're looking at in the genome. We can do this based off of a target bed file, a gene list, or a FASTA sequence. Um, and then we can design probes to capture those areas. Um, and we can also tailor the probe sequences to specific genomic events. So if you're looking at fusions or indels, um, we can design probes specifically to those genomic events. Um, and we have like a fusion probe across both partners. Um, or for an indel, we can place probes um, around the expansion. Um, after you've gotten a test pilot panel, we can, you can generate data and send it back to TWIST, and our team of bioinformatics scientists will run it through our um, bioinformatic troubleshooting pipeline, and we will alter the probe placement or add additional probes, subtract probes, potentially if they're over sticky regions, um, or increase the, the tiling density to increase the coverage. So we, can, we have a lot of tricks that we can do to make the panel as uniform um, and cover as much as your target regions as possible. Okay, so that's just a brief um, and quick outline of Twist and some of the technology that we have. Um, now I want to touch on a couple products that we've released in the last year or so um, that is really pushing the boundary in uh, genomics research. Uh, over the last year, we launched our Exome 2.0. This leverages all of the benefits of the um, uniform synthesis and, and uniformity that I just mentioned from our, our standard capture panels. Um, however, it was also developed um, with clinically relevant um, reason, regions in mind. So <clears throat> it covers 36 and a half megabases of the human coding and uh, non-coding regions. Um, but we also scoured recent database releases to make sure to include all clinically relevant and actionable variants um, that have been released um, recently. Uh, you can use the Exome 2.0 just off the shelf as, as a standalone um, Exome offering, uh, but you can also use it as a backbone to your own clinical LDT. So if you want to add additional content, we can um, in, in, add probe coverage and then blend it for you. Um, so really whatever you need to meet your, your needs. Uh, okay, so I've been talking a lot about capture and, and uniformity, but like what does that mean and, and how do we assess that? Um, so we use a analysis package from developed by Picard. Um, you might have heard of it. Um, it. It's something called Collect HS Metrics. It's pretty much uniformly used in the field. Um, and we use this to look at three main, three main metrics. The uniformity, um, which is assessed by something called the fold 80 base penalty. Um, and this is a metric that tells you how much um, the amount of sequencing needed to bring 80% of your target basis to the mean coverage. So. An ideal fold 80 base penalty would be one, meaning that every single one of your targets has exactly the same peak coverage. Um, the higher that number goes, the worse the, worse the uniformity is. Um, we look at specificity by the percent off bait, uh, or conversely, the percent on target. So the percent on target is the amount of sequencing coverage that you have that is lies over your baited region. Um, ideally, that would be 100%. And then lastly, the target coverage. So this is just 
um, the amount of sequencing that you have over your over your targets at a certain threshold. Typically, it's 30x, but you can set it to whatever you want. Um, so we did perform a series of independent bake-off studies um, for our exome 2.0, and then some of the other uh, exomes that are on the field uh, in the field. Um, as you can see here, the uniformity percent on target uh, and target bases at 30x is industry leading. Um, but really what this means is that you're not gonna lose your, your uh, targets and you're gonna have uh, as much sequencing depth that you need to augment any mitigations for uh, supplemental tests like Sanger to bridge any sequencing gaps um, from, your, from your primary NGS assay. Uh, okay, and then um, just recently, actually in February, we, we launched our CFDA pan cancer reference standards with the idea and the goal of helping um, researchers develop liquid biopsy assays. So there's three main components, or, or um, I, would, I would say uh, attended uses of the product, and that would be establishing the analytical limit of detection for a, a liquid biopsy assay, uh, to track the ongoing quality of that assay, um, and then in just general as a process control. Um, so what the material is, we actually take a um, donor-derived CFDNA as the background CFDNA for the material. Uh, which is really nice because it mimics, or very closely mimics, the fragmentation profile of native CFDNA, <clears throat> which is important for um, the use specifically as a reference standard. Uh, and then what we do is we tile 160 synthetic oligos that we print carrying the mutant allele um, across the variant site, and we tile those um, across the variant site to increase the robustness of the capture. Um, and we do that for 458 variant sites, 220 of which are single nucleotide variants, 215 are indels, and 15 are structural variants and fusions. So there's a lot of different variants to, to help you characterize the assay that, um, that you're trying to develop. I do want to point out here the indel size distribution. So this is really nice. Of the 215 indels that we introduce, um, the largest deletion is 30 base pairs, and the largest insertion is 19. So. Um, and then lastly, we offer the standards at seven different BAFs or variant allele frequencies. So um, you can order the 0%, which is just the CFDNA off the shelf there without the synthetic oligospikins for benchmarking. And then the variant allele frequencies range from 0.01% uh, all the way up to 5%. And then um, we, additionally, we have our methylation detection system, which combines uh, our highly efficient target enrichment with a novel enzymatic con conversion, um, which is much more cost efficient and streamlined than your traditional whole genome bisulfide sequencing, which can be quite harsh on the DNA itself. Um, so what we do is we use an enzyme to convert methyl your uh, libraries from uh, your CBG sites from um, unmethylated cytosines to uracils, and then ultimately into thiamine after PCR. Uh, but really where the magic comes in is during the capture. So we print four different probe species to each CPG site, um, and we do that uh, for both the top and bottom strand, and we do that under the assumption that each CPG site is fully methylated and unmethylated. And so what this does is during capture, you've got every combination of fully methylated and unmethylated for both the top and bottom strand, which is adds for, um, which results in extremely robust and comprehensive um, capture for methylation biomarkers. Okay, and then lastly here, uh, something that's near and dear to my heart, I've been working on it for a while, is um, our recently announced MRD Rapid 500 panels. Um, so, sorry. Um, in order to scale and grow with the growing liquid biopsy market, um, and in order to monitor minimal residual disease effectively, uh, we've uh, announced and launched our Rapid 500 panels, which um, contain anywhere from 100 to 500 probes per panel, and it can be ordered in, um, in quantities of up to 150 panels in a single order. Um, panel designs are pretty straightforward. Um, you can send us a single target bed file. Um, with all of the candidate variants of interest, and all we need is the genomic start and stop for each of the variants in question, and we will design MRD panels to those, um, to, the, to those variants. Um, and then lastly, the MRD panels are offered at an industry-leading price point, um, but also one of the, the biggest uh, takeaway, I think, is the, the turnaround time, which is six business days. So from the time that you send us your bed file, 
Um, that is the, marks the beginning of order intake, so that's one day of processing. And then five days after that, five business days after that, um, we have the panel shipped to you. I did include, include here some capture metrics. I won't dive into it because you probably can't see it, but uh, I do want to point out that the percent off bait for these panels is around 1.5 percent, or 1.5, um, or sorry, 15 percent, which is pretty remarkable for panels of this size. Uh, typically, capture panels below 500 or so um, can have increased non-specific off-target. Um, so the, the uh, captured data that we're producing with these is, is pretty phenomenal. Okay, thank you. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Jonathan Keats. Uh, he is the Director of Bioinformatics and Collaborative Sequencing Center, uh, and Assistant Professor in the Integrated Cancer Genomics Division at the Translational Genomics Research Institute here in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, he is also the Scientific Director of the Judy and Bernard Briskin Center for Multiple Myeloma Research at City of Hope. Uh, he earned his PhD in oncology at the University of Alberta and completed his fellowship training at the Mayo Clinic. His main research focus is on the genetics and associated biology of different multiple myeloma subtypes. He leads a functional focused lab uh, using cutting edge technology to improve our understanding of ge the genetic origins of myeloma and how therapeutic resistance develops. His primary contributions to the field of multiple myeloma include characterization of the clinical impact of T414, identification of constitutive activation of the NFKB pathway, and defining the clonal evolution of myeloma tumors with time and therapeutic selection. Okay, you guys do see a cursor. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity to come and speak of I actually might be one of the first times I've ever actually spoken at a meeting in Arizona. Uh, so it's kind of novel to walk from my office 10 minutes away. Um, so I'll try and walk you through a little bit of the work that we've been doing over the last couple of years, really looking at um, moving our exome offerings at TGen to what we think is a very good offering. And I'll walk you through some of the logic and decisions. Obviously, since I'm talking here, you can see where our decisions ultimately landed. So I'll give you a little background on what we'll try to walk through here in the next 30 minutes or less. Um, a little bit of background on our use case at TGen and why we're focused on some of the issues and what we care about. Uh, what we led us to elect to use, the Twist EF 2.0. We'll talk a little bit about UMIs or not to UMI and when and where. Um, I think a lot of people are aware of the issues and advantages that that can bring, but sometimes it's novel to people in the room. Uh, how we implemented it, and at least from our side, a little bit of the view on where we think the performance value, uh, value is there of the UMI system. So I, I run an independent research lab at TGen that's focused on myeloma, but since we're also one of the largest volume users of our sequencing center at TGen, uh, I, along with the informatics side that I took over about five years ago, about two years ago, I took over um, supervision of the sequencing center itself. And in the process, we kind of stepped back and said, we want to streamline our offerings to our TGen investigators and then people around the world and the country. So we do uh, always try to move everything onto automation. So for isolation, it's on the Kingfisher instrument uh, or it's a manual extraction. Sequencing library preparation, again, we always try to do robotics. It's on an Agilent Bravo liquid handler system. Um, that's from our genomes, our exome cap custom capture, and DNA and DNA methylation, RNA and DNA methylation. Pretty much all of our sequencing is NovaSeq 6000, quite honestly, but we're getting into some with Oxford with the Promethean. Uh, and then one thing we put a big focus on from our side is all of our analytical code is actually public facing. Some of my pipeline team is here, uh, but it's all available for the public consumption on GitHub if anyone needs access to some of that capabilities. So about a year ago, a year and a half ago probably now, we kind of stepped back and said, what do we need for our Exome catalog offering? I'll be honest, when I took over the core, we walked through the fridge and we had pretty much every kit you could imagine sitting in the fridge partially used because we would do what each customer asked. This one wants Agilent, this one wants IDT, uh, this one wants Agilent V5, this one wants Agilent V8. 
Um, so more from a cost side, I said, this is ridiculous. We're just going to do the effort of finding what we think is the best exome out there. And instead of letting people dictate to us how to do the sequencing, because they're coming to us because we're experts, we'll make sure we provide them the information to say, this is the product you should be using for the work you're going to do. So when we did that, we set out some requirements that we would have to make that offering. One, for the throughput, it had to be automation compatible. Uh, so we've been very happy. I, I have people on my team who will build automation uh, protocols that go onto the Bravo. But obviously it's nice if we have a base to start building from, uh, which was the case in the case with Twist for these kits. Obviously we have to be competitive with the landscape out there, so it had to be cost effective. One thing that we've seen with our Exome stuff is that is really where our low input space has been. We've shifted almost, a large volume of stuff has shifted to genomes from the research side. Where we see exome still prevailing is people need high coverage to look at low purity tumor cases. So a lot of our exomes tend to be 250 to 1,000x on whole exomes tends to be our general internal requests. We really did want a standardized protocol that would allow us, sometimes somebody wants to do something on a dog and somebody wants to do something on human and we are mixing matching those in runs. So it would be nice if the protocol allowed that. Uh, so that was nice. And then everyone always wants to spike in their own custom content. And with some vendors, you have to buy the whole catalog assay plus the custom content as an individual tube, which makes turnaround time. And that way you get stuck with this large vat of probes, being able to tell customers, if you want custom content, you buy your custom content, we'll spike it into the base exome. And then it makes us really streamlined cost effectively. So it's been something we've liked. And because of coverage interests, um, and especially for custom captures, we've always been interested in adapting UMIs. And my general complaint when people come to my office, do you have a UMI offering? And until, quite honestly, the last year or so, most companies didn't really have a, an effective UMI offering that was commercially available. You were stuck buying it yourself. So some of the stuff I'll show you as we go through and we made decisions on things. Uh, anyone who's worked in my lab knows this. Um, we focus almost everything on the library prep side on what we call conversion efficiency. It's not mine. Uh, this is from one of the people that was one of the senior people at uh, Kappa before it was purchased by Roche who really set me on to this idea. But using a way of tracking how efficient is your library. So it's pretty simple. Li amount of library produced, you correct for the number of PCR cycles versus the amount of DNA that went in, and you can calculate the e efficiency. Now, anyone who's been in the NGS space for a long enough time, if you remember the original TrueSeq library preps from circa 2010, 2012, when you run this, it's less than 1%. So the stuff that most of us grew up with, they were atrocious. That's why you needed a microgram to go in. So a, probably eight years ago, we kind of did some testing. This was largely with 200 nanogram inputs. And we tested different PCR cycles to estimate how efficient the PCR was because we added a PCR efficiency correction to this, which is this little 65 up here. Really, if it's PCR, it should be two, that for each cycle, you double and double. And I only point that out because you're going to see something that looks a little ridiculous in a second. Um, so our internal limbs has this baked in as the calculation. We haven't changed it because all of our protocols, our batch comparison, our user comparisons, we have ranges we expect for kits. And if I change that calculation the way it should be, bad things will happen. Um, so we're just stuck with this silliness. Um, we did, I'll admit, when we see lower PCR, lower inputs, we always kind of saw higher PCR efficiency, which makes sense in the old adage. If you put too much, too, too much DNA in your PCR, you will kill the PCR reaction. So just to bring you into why we elected ultimately to kind of migrate to the Twist EF 2.0 library preps. Um, on the left, you can kind of see some of the work we did. This is quite a long time ago for the large uh, genome project that I run where we were sequencing 1,000 patients with multiple myeloma. And when we started in the old days, so this 27%, this is the old TrueSeq days, a microgram of input. We were only getting roughly 30% of the patients analyzed. But you can see that conversion efficiency <laughs> is basically sitting at zero. Um, when we started optimizing the preps a little bit um, and then pushing it to our automation, we found a couple of tricks. 
actually one of the biggest tricks was we were just putting too much DNA into the library reaction. You could get it upwards of 50%. Switching to another kit, uh, we pushed it up to 68% and then with some additional optimization of concentrations and PCR conditions, we could push it up to 91%. Um, so part of this is just highlighting that value of tracking conversion efficiency. Um, so our, our day-to-day -day operating protocol at TGen for the better part of six to eight years was this, where we would expect 50% conversion rate. You can see I went and grabbed one of our most recent protocol pro projects that was using that old platform. We were averaging about 50%. And I took one of our new projects that was what well, we've moved over to Twist EF 2.0 libraries. Uh, and you see that silliness that I highlighted to you that the percent conversion, remember percent, it's estimated about 175. Um, now it's because that 65% correction for PCR is bogus, at least in this prep. Uh, so if you correct it the way it should be with a two for the uh, conversion efficient for the PCR eff efficiency, the true estimated conversion efficiency we're seeing with that kit is 46%. So you put in 100 molecules of DNA, 46 of them come out as library. Um, again, as you can appreciate that these two graphs, this is actually pretty damn good uh, in my opinion. Um, the other one that I wanted to do, kind of highlight that because it'll get into some of the UMI discussions and it gets into things that always gets me in trouble when I review papers, is uh, math is a bitch sometimes. Um, and my favorite is the people who do cell-free DNA and say they put five nanograms of DNA in and I do 20,000 X coverage. And I'm like, well, your informatics sucks because it's not physically possible. Uh, but in case somebody wants to challenge me on the math or you uh, just want to know, if you follow the twist protocol with 50 nanograms of input, the theoretical max coverage you can get if you sequenced every molecule of a diploid DNA is 15,000 X. So that, that's your limit. Um, so when someone says 20 or 50,000 X and they said 20 nanograms, call the bullshit on them, please. Um, if we take what we were observing for that 40% conversion, 46% conversion rate, in theory, with our standard 50 nanogram inputs, we could theoretically get to about 7,000 X coverage if we sequenced every molecule that went into the library. Uh, and obviously that's a linear effect. Um, so do you really need high coverage? Do you need high accuracy? Uh, I work a lot in the myeloma space where a lot of our regions of interest are in highly repetitive sequences or they're the VDJ recombination, which have lots of repeats and homology across the genome. So getting things right and counting things correctly is pretty important to us. So we do, we've been interested in using UMIs. And I'm gonna just say we're interested. We haven't extensively used this. So what did UMIs do if you're not aware? It allows you to prevent identical fragments from being marked as duplicates. So a lot of the sequencing effort that we do from informatics is you look at the alignments and two reads that are aligned and start and stop at the same spot, like these over here, we would mark as duplicates. So we go from all of these reads in this colored region to just those three left over. And we grab the ones that have the best quality metrics. Um, so like my informaticians, they like, this one's the best one, we'll keep that one. Doesn't matter if it has an error in it or if it's true, we just keep the ones that have the best sequencing metrics. So there is one thing where UMIs can help because if you just throw in a UMI and say, okay, keep the reads that have unique molecule identifiers, the colored labels over here, you keep a whole lot more molecules. So it increases your coverage because you're not throwing out what we call fragment duplicates. They're not PCR-induced duplicates. They're not sequencer-induced duplicates. They're just two pieces of DNA happening to break at the exact same point. And as you do higher and higher coverage, you're more likely to have those situations. Where the UMIs can really become powerful is it allows you to do error correction. So yes, uh, PCR induces error, so you can remove some of the errors that are induced by PCR. The sequencing instruments add error, right? We Illumina, it's about 0.2% on the forward read, 0.3, 0.4% on the reverse read on good quality runs. So you, you do actually have errors coming from the sequencer and you can use this to actually correct those errors to get more confident sequence measurements. And as you wanna push allele frequencies into the sub 1% range, this starts to become extremely important. 
There are different types of UMIs. Uh, there are in, what I would call inline UMIs. So it's you read one, read two of your Lumina sequencer, you read into the UMI or the first bases you get. There are other ones where it's part of the UMI. People have different opinions on which one. I've always been looking for the inline ones. The complication of the inline one is the manufacturing is a lot more difficult to do that, and that's why it took so long for people to make them commercially available, I'm assuming, because I kept asking. And then the other one is, do you want a structured UMI or a random UMI? And what I mean by that is, if you think of the UMI, a lot of companies offer it's just N, 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 and wow, we have millions of UMIs available. Well, if you work on the informatics side, it doesn't help you because we know the sequencer makes errors. When you're looking at two molecules and you think it's one molecule says T, 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 the other one says T, 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 A, T, is that an error of an A in that one or is that a unique molecule? We have to assume it's a unique molecule, which makes the informatics horrible. When we know it's structured, we know the T, 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 A does not exist, we can correct that one back to the T, T. So we always look for a structured UMI. Uh, and if you think of all those things that I walked through, this is where we really did like the twist UMI system. It is a structured UMI. It is an inline UMI system. Uh, if I had a complaint, I wish there was more because I always want more, but there's 32 distinct UMIs. That gets you 100, 124 unique combinations. So if you think of duplicates, if I had two reads, or if I have reads that have the identical start and stop, now I have the opportunity to have 1,024 unique molecules with the exact same start and stop pile up. I can shift by one base pair, another 1,024, shift by one base pair, and you can quickly see that the coverage goes up very quickly. Uh, they talk about some nice things about the power of the error correction. I won't get into that. I think their informatics is generally correct. The other thing that I think they did a good job of is anyone who hates adding phi x into your sequencing run, they at least actually shifted their UMI. So half the UMIs are five base pairs, then the universal T for the ligation, and then six base pairs with the universal T. And so you drop one base, but by shifting them, at least you don't get this universal T at cycle seven or cycle six in your sequencing that causes your sequencer to go ballistic. So our first question when we got these was, wow, uh, Twist now has to make 32 unique UMI adapters, pool them nice and equal molar, and this is all gonna work as good as their single U adapter that we tested and I showed you that test data before. So the question is, is the UMI equivalent to the universal adapter that they make available? Short answer is what we generally found was the UMI adapter is actually slightly outperforming. So conversion efficiency was a little bit better by comparison. Library picomolarity, which should be a direct correlate, a little bit better. I would just leave it at, they seem equivalent. So I think they did a good job of manufacturing their 32 and pooling them together. Um, it seems like that is working. The next question is, well, now you're actually pooling 32 together. And for any of us that try to throw things on their sequencer and you throw 32 libraries and you want them to be nice and evenly across the sequencer, know how hard that actually is to get a function. So the question was, how evenly distributed are their 32 UMI sequences? The red line you're seeing here for three different fractions from a patient test that we've done recently. Um, you can see that the red line is the expected trend, should they be perfect? Um, there's pretty good agreement. Um, from my side, I would say I'm happy with this. It's close to expected. There's no one shooting off at 10% instead of the 3% roughly expected average. Nothing's dropping below 1%. I'd say they're well balanced. What you will notice in this plot is maybe my biggest complaint. Um, we have a lot of reads here that are associated with NNN. So these are the reads where after the structured UMI was evaluated and we tried to correct it, and I'll, I'll I'll call out the twist team. Their recommended thing is not to correct the UMIs. Our, our workflow, we correct the UMIs exclusively. These are the reads that drop out when you correct the UMIs because there was errors from the sequencing read. Maybe these are errors from synthesis. Um, but what we are noticing is if you look at the kind of the goal, the green lines here, these are the the few the reads that were actually associated with that UMI, but actually were corrected events. 
And what you'll notice is, first off, there's the one over here that has the highest peak. So this is the only one of the UMIs that has a three, um, three nucleotide hamming distance from all the other 32 UMIs. So it's the most correctable, and noticeably you see the most corrections. You also do notice a lot of, the re lot of them don't have any correction. This is largely because they're largely uncorrectable given the small space with only a five base pair UMI. Again, it's a trade-off of accuracy and benefit. Again, we're happy. We suspect a lot of this is just sequencing error. So with like the announcement from PacBio with their new short read high accuracy sequencer, that kind of, I think this is more of an Illumina issue. Illumina always struggles in the first couple of bases of the sequencing read. So this is something that will get better with other technologies anyways. So there are multiple options in the way you're going to process this, and that would be the one, again, I'm more on the informatic. I, I tell you I know how to do a bone marrow better than I know how to do anything, but I know the informatics probably um, the next best. How you're gonna use UMIs really depends on your application and the input and honestly, the intelligence of your team and how they're using it. Um, what I would tell you is the far right is obviously the best case or what we often call duplex sequencing. So this is full leveraging the UMI error correction. The disadvantage of doing duplex sequencing is you have to do a crap ton of sequencing to actually leverage that. So there is a huge cost effect and if you're gonna use a large panel, like a megabase, it becomes amazing how much sequencing you need to make that work with a duplex sequencing. So unless you're talking little micro 200 KB panels, achieving proper sequencing depth to really leverage duplex sequencing is very difficult. But we went through and did some comparisons internally, running our pipeline, turning on and off features where we just do default duplicate marking, start and stop where we do the UMI aware approach. So we're just saying each UMI is a unique entity. We're not error correcting. Running it when we actually correct the UMI. So there's actually a little bit of data loss when you correct the UMI. Those reads that couldn't be corrected are kicked out of the an analysis. And then also doing UMI corrected in what we call single read family. So we're collapsing by the reads. We're not looking at the pair strands and running that through. So. When you're going to do that, um, what is recommended by Twist and what we do also is leverage some tools from Fulcrum, um, Fulcrum Genomics. What's Fulcrum Genomics, right? Sorry, I got to get their name right because they're local guys and good people. So this is a uh, really a service bioinformatics group that. Um, has taken some of the tools they made and have made them open source. And one of the things that they made open source that I think is really impressive is their UMI-based uh, analytics. So for those of us who played with something like UMI tools years and years ago, it was slower in hell. They've done a good job of updating it, uh, and especially what is now their recommended protocol. So if you look at that good informatics suggestions, they have some best practices, their, their old, um, broad people, so I think in GADK best practice kind of recommendations, they have good recommendations on how to process the reads and how to walk through. But it's now a fully compartmentalized tool with their open source FGBio tools and SAM tools that you can walk through it. There are two major filters that if you're dealing with your informatics team, tell them, like, do they really understand what the dash dash strategy option is? Because that controls, if you're gonna do that single read consensus, UMI, duplex, and then the minimum reads, because this also affects how it's gonna filter the data down. So the decisions people made there impacts how much you have to sequence. Um, so it's, it's pretty important to know that interplay between those events. What we've generally found when we do this, and you can kind of see it in this graph up above, we rarely, with our one megabase capture kit for clonal hematopoiesis, our six megabase capture kit for the myeloma replacing fish, we never get close to being able to leverage the full duplex sequencing. So we've kind of elected to stay with the single read consensus. Not because we think it's the best way, but because it's the balance of value of the UMI system and also the sequencing depth that we can achieve. So this is one of our cohorts, uh, just quickly giving you some idea, like duplicate rates across this uh, one megabase capture, about 50% across the cohort. 
Coverage across that was estimated about 1,500. This is after leveraging that single read consensus approach. So if you look at the data, and really what I want you to take is this, this edge, this interplay on how much data do you lose? So we have about a six to 8% reduction in the duplicate reads. I'll be honest and say, I thought there was a lot more what I would call fragment duplicates, where the same fragment, there's two different fragments where they would have different UMIs. Uh, there's not nearly as many as what I appreciated or I expected, but we do salvage six to 8% of the data. You can see uh, on target metrics actually shift upwards when you remove this because you're getting rid of a lot of the duplicates that are counted in some of those metrics. The converse is how does that affect coverage? And what you quickly see is we gain about 15 to 20% in the coverage by using a UMI aware system. You will notice that that UMI aware where we're not taking advantage of the error correction is where you get the most advantage. But when you error correct it, which is probably saying some of those things were, we thought were different UMIs, but they were sequencing error or synthesis error. When we throw those out because you shouldn't be trusting those, you actually don't lose very much, uh, and you still get that huge benefit in the increase in coverage uh, with single, at least this is with single read consensus on the far side. Uh, if we went to the full duplex, we just don't sequence enough, it would really drop off. So a little bit of example of why we moved to this uh, was really to use for clonal hematopoiesis. Um, I think in a lot of the spaces, everyone's got an interest in clonal hematopoiesis, but I'm a hematologist uh, and everyone is cuckoo crazy about it, in my opinion, but it means that when you do genetics in the blood cancer space, <laughs> I get asked to do clonal hematopoiesis quite often. So we built up our own custom capture. This is a twist custom capture approach. It was focused on questions in multiple myeloma. I'll be honest, it's a one megabase kit. It's bigger than a lot of the other ones, but it was done so by design so that we had controls for classic chip mutations versus classic myeloma mutations versus mutations that are common in solid tumors. So we had some controls for evaluating how pure our sample was and devoid of tumor. For if you haven't heard of what clonal hematopoiesis is, this is an aging phenomenon that as we age, somatic mutations accumulate within our hematopoietic stem cells that contribute to a fraction of our white blood cell system where we start to see white mutations, particularly mutations associated with uh, acute myelogenous leukemia appearing as we age and the incidence of people developing AML that derive from those clones are increasing when people have these evidence. And CHIP has been associated with every single phenotype, myocardial infarction. Somehow it actually inhibits Alzheimer's, you name it. Somebody's found it as like, it's the magic pill for some reason. Um, it drives me nuts. So a little bit of summary metrics from that test cohort. And well, I won't berate about my opinions on CHIP anymore. Um, so we saw with this kit, and again, this is single read consensus based, nice even distribution of reads. Um, so reads to coverage, uh, fairly tight distribution that reflects again what we think is the general performance from capture kits from Twist. Uh, one thing I would point out, and I, I would just call out some of the things that we did or just make recommendations for, if people are interested in high coverage hybrid capture, one of the limitations of using HS metrics is it caps the per target coverage at 100x. You don't see percent coverage above 100x. So if you're doing high coverage, 500x, knowing what percentage of targets were at 30x is really absolutely meaningless. Uh, SAM tools does allow you to make these measurements at much higher depths and you can set it. Again, we make software and processing available. So we, we look at up to 2000X in different bins ourselves. So if you're ever interested and need to go above and beyond what Picard would give you, uh, and because it's really important sometimes to see that percentage of targets at 500X or 1000X, depending on your design, because that's where you see that dropout effect with your different capture kits. You can't see it at 100X. Um, so we, we have found that to be very valuable. And really where we've been looking for this is for the clonal hematopoiesis work, we're interested in picking up events that are in the 1% range or greater. Obviously we are interested in making measurements below 1%. Uh, 
But for calling that that's a chip mutation, like a lot of people in the field, we've set a 1% allele frequency threshold with some base requirements. So not to go too deep into any of the specific studies, but taking the approach that we've been using with the single read consensus UMI-based approach, it's allowed us to get to that high 1500X coverage a little bit faster than if we weren't using a UMI. We, without using the UMI, we would have been at about 1200 average. And you can see, like in this case, we're comparing bone marrow and peripheral blood compartments where you can visualize that the mutation existed in all of them, but in one case it was less than 1%. So from our threshold calling, we didn't call it in the bone marrow because it was below 1%, but it was easily detectable had we set our base thresholds. The other one is now when we're looking at these paired samples, what we've seen is good correlation between the two compartments and their allele frequency. And more importantly, we can readily detect stuff well below 1% with the UMIs when we shift our calling thresholds. Um, so it really has given us the opportunity to now take that UMI-based approach and get accurate calling. So some quick uh, conclusions. Hopefully, the, maybe the most slam dunk thing I would tell you in the beginning is if you're looking to adopt a new assay and you're trying to maximize efficiency, the Twist EF 2.0 kit is a very high efficiency kit. I, we just haven't tested anything ourselves. We're all welcome to, happy to test it, but we haven't seen anything that outcompetes it. It outcompetes most things substantially. Um, the Twist UMI adapter system is at least equivalent to their universal adapter system that led to that really good conversion efficiency. And what we've seen is actually the 32 UMIs are really well um, spaced. The one I didn't, I was on a slide, but I realized as we go through this, I didn't mention, but one other thing that allowed, made us really interested in using Twist, especially when we thought about the duplex sequencing, is by their capture kits actually being a double-stranded DNA, the whole idea of the duplex sequencing is that you actually sequence the top strand and the bottom strand. In a perfect world, you sequence the original top strand, the original bottom strand. With hybrid capture that is only one side baited, you never see the original molecule from the bottom strand or the top strand, whichever is being captured. The only one you see is after one cycle PCR. So it really defeats the whole concept of the duplex sequencing. People skirt it, but if you want to be a purist, and I get in trouble for being a purist, the only way to truly do duplex sequencing is to actually look at both strands and you want to have the original molecules for both strands in an absolute purist, and that's something that TWIST does give you. And then the last one is just, even after some data loss with a UMI error correction, again, I highly recommend that you would apply it, uh, but you, it's not uh, the required. Uh, we do see a significant improvement in coverage like you'd expect. More where we've been looking at it from this day is the extra sequencing effort to eat the extra reads to generate the UMI far generates more coverage than the the loss of sequencing effort or money that goes into sequencing the UMI. So we've always seen it be a data return. And I would say we internally are just arguing about are we going to just use UMIs for everything and then sometimes trim if people don't want it or not. Um, I'm honestly leaning that way just to simplify our internal work streams. And the only reason we don't is because so often our lanes on our NovaSeq has RNA sequencing or something. And I'd like to everything just be 100 by 101 by 101 and if we're going to do 101 by and then some need to be 108 something needs to be trimmed and it drives daniel here in the audience crazy because he takes care of all our bcl conversion he'd have to automate all that decision making so we just haven't done it yet but we we go back and forth about that um, but that's the last one and i'm happy to take any questions on what i did and i'm sure sean's also happy to answer any questions if you guys have any So the, the one where we saw the biggest improvement in conversion efficiency was with, um, okay, I, I don't work for Twist, I can say. So when Kappa Hyper came out, 
and their end repair a tailing clearly is so much more efficient. I should know the enzymatic, but when end repair a tailing went to that 65 degree step instead of the classic 37 degree step, whatever the magic thing. So I, I think a lot of it is inefficient a tailing and end repair a tailing not going to completion because we saw that huge bump there. Um, Obviously, twist EF 2.0 is a fragmentation-based thing versus Covaris, and I think it's relatively well accepted that the amount of end repair needed with the enzymatic frag is very, there's very small things needing to be corrected versus Covaris. It's not bad, but it leaves more staggered ends that need to be end repaired. So my first guess is end repair and a tailing not going to completion. The other one is, I suspect by the time you go through the whole process, a lot of the molecules that you put in 50 nanograms of double-stranded DNA by qubit or whatever, by the time it's getting to the ligation step, a lot of those molecules are no longer double-stranded and the ligation is failing is what I suspect is the other main mechanism. The honest answer, because more coming from our service, so internal to TGen where I control the informatics, it's not an issue. We, we would process it correctly. When we're distributing data to, and it's not an example, but it just pick on, we, we do sequencing for people at ASU. If we give them back data and they don't realize there's a UMI in line, the first question I get back is, why are there soft clipping all over my reads and they're all like one of these 32 sequences? And that's really the balance is if people knew we always offered that and if we, what we haven't done on our core side is we, do, we don't aggressively offer an analysis. I think we do it really well. Uh, it's all highly automated, but we don't push it on people and I think that's the biggest one is we just don't want to deal with the confusion for customers when they're asking why it looks weird. That would be where I would lean. We would just trim it for those people because they're not aware it's there and they didn't actually pay for it. Not that we would upcharge for it anyways because it's such a nominal difference in the cost for the UMI or not UMI. But. So, so you think it's it's mainly a bioinformatic challenge, not like a, a sample type or use case. You would use UMIs. If you knew how to process the data, you would use them pretty universally. Yeah, like from what we've seen, I, again, we'd go back and forth, but. I, I highly doubt there'll be much that my team does that is not at least using the UMI in single read consensus mode going forward. Because it, it adds coverage. It, you get a little bit of error correction. So it's a win-win. I, I don't know how to argue against not doing it. And I, what is it, like $3 more per sample for using the UMIs? It's a negligible. Like, the coverage is worth that $3 easily. So my lab, no, because I'm a hematologist and I, sh it's like FFPE go away. Um, from the core side, yes, we, we have had to, we've had to do some FFPE work, uh, is least favorite in my world. Uh, we have had good success in completing exome studies with the enzymatic. What I would, the first one is the conversion efficiency instead of being at the 150% was 30%. What I would say is compared to our historical kind of optimized protocol being applied to FFP material, different input concentrations, so there's, there's caveats. We weren't seeing that same 30%. We were getting more like seven, 8%, so it was still always okay. So we still have seen with FFP material, it outperformed. I think when you get into the cell-free DNA, which is already basically prefragged to the optimum exome size, that's one where the kit doesn't make sense. Um, 
there are, I don't know, Sean can probably answer. Like, I know the answer. The, the kit that we're using, there is an option to do it without the enzymatic frag. Um, I know Twist doesn't offer it today. Uh, at least they didn't talk about it, but it's 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 a it's it exists. Um, so I think that optimization can be done. I'll be honest to say, like for when it comes to FFP, like one of the things we tried a long time ago was just single stranded libraries, and that does rescue a lot of stuff, and I think is a good viable option. Um, but it was just the library prep cost of that single stranded ligation is so expensive that it really makes it painful. Would be suitable threshold for you would apply. Um, so again, we haven't been sequencing deep enough to set that high. So we, we just set it at one because we do the single read consensus and we've been keeping that uh, largely because we weren't trying to achieve the massive error correction. Um, if we were doing it as a target for single for the full proper correction. My first response is I would set it to a minimum of three um, per family, preferably by strand with duplex sequencing. That would be my minimum. Um, for a, something where we were really going to push the limits of the error correction, I would say it's gotta be more like five or 10. Uh, but at a minimum three, that would be what I would have our team, that would be our default in our pipe. It, it is the default in the pipeline if you do duplex. Uh, well, seeing nothing else, thank you very much for your time and I appreciate the attention.